I wonder if they fired that editor. I once wrote a story that was published in a magazine twice. The same magazine, the same story, two months in a row. <laughs> and it was called Today's Trophy Mule Deer. Hi, I'm Ron Spomer, and welcome to another episode of RSO Podcast. I came across two articles, and I thought, these this is the same title. And then I started reading it, Sing the Praises of the Wily Whitetail. Sing the Praises of the Wily Whitetail. <laughs> it's the same story. So I looked. I must have sold it to two different magazines. I looked. It's the same magazine. I think I'm going to leave the name out of it just so I don't embarrass the editors. But then I thought, oh, I remember this years ago. I remember them calling me and apologizing for having published the uh, story two times in a row. <laughs> Somebody got things wrong at that publication and they published the same story in their magazine in two subsequent issues. <laughs> I bet somebody paid the price for that one. So, I don't know, it must have been a heck of a story. Maybe we should read it. It's called Today's Trophy Mule Deer. Hold out for the big boys. Now, which one should I read? Well, it's the same story. So, I'll read this one. I like that picture. I don't know if you're not uh, watching this on YouTube, just listening to it. I'm holding up the front page, title page, and there is a beautiful, widespread, long tine mule deer buck on there, the kind we all dream about. And I remember photographing that guy in South Dakota one lucky day with the sunshine glinting off of his antlers. Whew, what a buck. I've never taken as many big mule deer bucks as whitetails, but boy, I've sure tried. They are a wary, wily creature. Let's see what my story is all about. Once again, from the unnamed publication, Today's Trophy Mule Deer by Ron Spomer. Sing the praises of the wily whitetail all you want, but I'll wager you'll have more trouble collecting a big mule deer buck. Low numbers, limited range, over harvest of bucks in many areas, and extreme shyness make mature muleys North America's rarest big game trophy. Even when you find a piece of the West that harbors a few, you'll pay hell trying to catch one in your sights. Your first hurdle is getting permission to hunt the big boys. Most states now severely limit tags in well-managed trophy buck units. To get one, you usually have to enter a lottery. Your odds for winning are about the same as being selected as Liz Taylor's next husband. <laughs> Possible, but not likely. This is going back a few years. In some states like Idaho, you can still buy a general firearms buck tag, but you'll be limited to a 7- or 14-day season in the middle of October when the woods are dry and the bucks are hiding in thick forest below their open summer alpine habitats. They'll be above their open winter valley habitats. They don't bugle like elk. They don't feed all day like black bears. They don't travel predictable routes from bedding to feeding areas like whitetails, and they rarely respond to calls. They could be on one mountain today and two mountains over tomorrow. Last but certainly not least, mature bucks can be sprinkled as sparsely as one for every 10 square miles of habitat. Folks, it ain't an encouraging picture. What is encouraging are trophy management programs like Colorado's Ranching for Wildlife, Utah's Limited Entry Trophy Units, and Idaho's Complicated Restrictive Harvest Regimen. Thanks to these and similar regulations designed to limit the annual take of mule deer bucks, more of these uncommon animals are living long enough to grow massive antlers. You might not get a permit to hunt them every year, but when you do, you'll actually have something to hunt, like I did last November. There's your buck. Lots of mass. He might go 28 inches, said outfitter Tom Teets. He announced it seconds after he'd found that heavily antlered mule deer in his binocular. Teets is an optimist, and he likes to put the best construction on everything, so I took his enthusiasm with a grain of salt. The buck was standing near the corner of an irrigated alfalfa field with three does. As my guide set up his spotting scope, I studied our quarry's antlers through a 10x Swarovski binocular. Well, they were heavy, but something was wrong with the forks. He seems to be short on tine length. I think that left front fork is crabbed, I said. And I meant the two end tines look more like a crab's short pincers than a tree's long forked branches. Well, by now the deer were moving into that field toward a weedy fence. 
but Teats had the scope on him. No, no, that extra tine sticking off. That's what it is, said the Colorado guide. He's got some junk on that side. Take a look. The buck paused just before leaping the fence as I studied him at 40X. He did indeed have an extra point or two on the left antler, one sticking several inches inside, but I clearly saw a short left front fork. That would severely hamper his score. Nevertheless, he was a splendid specimen. His ladies led him into a narrow band of cottonwoods and willows along a stream and unceremoniously bedded. One second his inspiring antlers were protruding above the grass, the next instant they were gone. Ah, they'll stay put all day unless someone spooks them, and that rancher isn't letting anyone in, Teet said. You wait at the edge of that field, I'll bet you they'll come out tonight. Well, I did. He came out behind the does and a smaller buck that we hadn't seen. It was just four o'clock, and I'd only crawled into position along that weedy fence line for 40 minutes, sitting there with my back against the cedar post, the Kimber Model 84M rifle propped atop aluminum shooting sticks. I was ready. The trim, responsive little rifle was chambered for the staid 308 Winchester, a bit out of fashion in these super magnum times, but with its sleek, drag-resistant 150-grain swift Sirocco launched at 2,850 feet per second, well, it would shoot flat enough for a dead-on hold out to 300 yards. Holding just over a buck's back line would suffice out to 400 yards, and the pillar-bedded rifle was shooting minute of angle, so I was confident. Well, I couldn't believe such an old buck would expose himself so early in the afternoon within a 1,000 yards of a county road. But there he was, antlers projecting above his widespread ears, and a substantial butt, well, he was a tempting target for poachers. I guess the only reason he hadn't been shot was the limited access in the lightly populated ranching district. All private property was posted, the ranch roads were regularly patrolled, and the tags were extremely limited, so poachers and casual hunters must have been going elsewhere. The wind was in my favor, and the deer were 250 yards away so I had plenty of time to study them with the spotting scope turned as high as 60x. I estimated the buck's antlers at about 25 inches square, a clean four-pointer on the right with a three-inch brow tine. The left antler sported a three-inch sticker off the back tine and a four-inch non-typical point protruding from the G4 tine into the center of the rack. That left front fork, unfortunately, hadn't grown any longer since morning. And it probably wouldn't measure more than five inches deep. Well, that was the first day of my hunt. The orange moon was glowing above the eastern horizon when Tom met me hiking up the road. Hey, did you get him? He asked as I climbed into the cab. No, I passed him up. Had him inside of 300 yards for about an hour. Watched him feed, watched him bed, memorized those antlers. Ah, they just don't score well. With the potential that you've got around here, I'm not going to burn my tag on the first day. Well, that's another stumbling block to tag in a trophy mule deer shooting too soon. After years spent glassing spindly-antlered three-year-old bucks, it's difficult to pass up a heavily beamed four- or five-year-old. Both age classes often sprout similar 24 to 25-inch high and wide antlers, but the added mass of the older racks makes them look wonderfully impressive, and they are, but not when compared with the extremely rare 28-inch racks of even older bucks. A mule deer buck rarely grows his best antlers until his sixth or seventh year, and few live that long. Teats was guiding in a hunting unit where some do. The ranch manager had told us about one such buck the evening before we started hunting. I don't know how many inches wide it's been, but it sticks way out past his ears, way past his body when he walks away, the rancher said. Right up there in that corn stubble. The weathered cowman gestured south of the ranch house past the big cottonwoods shading the buffalo grass lawn. I could have hit him with a rock once. He was laying beside the center pivot with a smaller buck and two does. Well, that sounded like the sort of old buck we were looking for. Of course, we couldn't find him in that corn. Nor the next morning, nor next evening, or the morning after. I still hunted the big rolling pasture south of the harvested cornfield peering carefully into deep draws, slipping into the north wind through virtual forests of waist-high yuccas, I was anticipating the explosion of a bedded buck at every step. Knowing that experienced mule deer bed with a long view, I glassed distant draws, creek bottoms, and cut banks meticulously and repeatedly. 
I had taken two steps up a ridge, and I'd glass. And I'd take another step, and I'd glass again. First around the near ground that opened before me, and then the middle, and finally the far landscape. One step in elevation can often uncover a protruding antler. Two steps can alert a bedded buck and send him running. Often distant bucks warned by a hunter's bobbing head will slip away unseen and unsuspected. You never know what you missed. Several years ago, I was hunting Montana mule deer with Powder River Outfitters out of Broadus. My partner was a novice who, on the opening morning, ignored the admonition of our guide, slipped away from us, and he walked to the top of a ridge to see what he could see. And what he saw were two huge bucks that promptly bounced over the next ridge. When they again popped into view, they were leaping a fence onto posted property 400 yards away. If that hunter had known enough to cross that one ridge one step at a time, glassing the newly exposed ground after each step, he might have seen them before they saw him. And we'd both have been butchering instead of regretting. Despite my slow and careful work in the Colorado yucca pasture, I found no deer, but a ranch hand checking irrigation units had. About eight this morning, I jumped him from that winter wheat just east of the road there, the young cowboy said as our pickup sidled side by side on the narrow pasture road. Across from the standing corn, Teets asked. Heck, we glassed, we glassed that whole area and we didn't see a thing. Well, he was laying in the koshuies right next to the pump there. I'd have seen him before he stood up. I'd say he was a good 28 inches wide. He's not no 30-incher, but he's a big one. Oh, that infamous 30-inch muley. It's a western standard like a 16-inch antelope or a 6x6 elk. But spread alone does not make a trophy buck. Tine length is more significant. I have seen Boone and Crockett racks with 20-inch spreads. Nevertheless, a 28-inch spread with equal height, good mass, and long forks, whew, that should score 180 points or more. We wanted a look at this buck. Let's give this pasture a quick look while we're here, I said the next morning before sunup as Teach drove us toward the wheat field where that big buck had been last seen. We stopped and scanned the yucca pasture south of the corn. Two does were feeding in the corn, half the size of the black yearling Angus that foraged among them. Well, there they are, Teach said. Up that far draw, two does and a small buck. I'll bet those are the ones that were with the big buck. We watched until all three deer dropped into a deep erosion cut. After 15 minutes, they hadn't come out. Mm, must have bedded. Yeah, we had assumed the big buck was with them. So we hiked out there. We slipped to the edge of that cut and we tossed stones until the small buck bounced out at slingshot range. Then came the doe and fawn. The buck we wanted was not with him. Man, that would have been a slam dunk if he'd have been in there. What with broken terrain and strong winds in the West, mule deer are often easily stalked once they're spotted. That's why glassing is such a popular tactic. But it takes determination and sharp optics to see the gray pelage of a deer bedded amid gray dirt, rocks, and sage. My Powder River Outfitters guide, Paul, proved this to me time and again when he announced the location of bucks that I hadn't seen. Right under that big rock, just left of the one lone cedar near the top of the butte, he'd explain. And I'd glass and glass until I'd finally see a deer that had been lying in the open the whole time. Because so many of those deer lay with their backs against a hillside or rim rock, we were able to swing wide, get above them, and stalk down within bow range. But it took experience and a sharp binocular or spotting scope to see them initially. I wouldn't want to tackle the job without a good binocular. Teets and I glassed extensively during our Colorado High Plains hunt, hiking up winding pasture drainages that bent and forked as they dipped toward the river valley below. Some were wide and shallow, forcing us to glass from afar. Others were tight and narrow, enabling us to ease along their rims for closer looks into their rocky or brushy bottoms. But they also forced us to hike their entire lengths in order to see all the hiding places. We found does, small bucks, medium bucks, and even two splendid white-tail bucks, but no monster muleys. we just finished working our third extensive draw of the afternoon and were heading towards the wheat field where that 28-inch buck had last been seen when we spotted several deer walking down a sagebrush ridge. 
We were within a mile of the alfalfa field where I'd passed up the 25-inch buck with that short left fork. There's your buck, Teats said. That's him. That's the one you passed up. Where, I asked. The alfalfa field below was clearly empty. No, not down in the field, up there in the brakes. I finally had to lower my binocular and look where my guide was pointing. Well, I still couldn't see the deer against the low sun. Right on the ridge. Second one over. Finally, I spotted the white nose and black forehead of a mule deer buck. It was closer than I expected. It was looking right at me, and it was clearly big. There was a smaller buck and three does with it. At first, I thought it was the alfalfa field buck. It had a similarly heavy antlers, the frame about 25 inches square and several non-typical points in the left antler. But then I realized the sticker points were different. This was a different buck. And in my excitement of seeing it backlit against the lowering sun, its antlers rimmed with a halo, I made a classic mistake. When it ducked behind its ridge, I ran to a clearing in the sage, nestled into a shooting position, picked the buck up in the 2.5 to 8x loophole scope when it again popped into view, now trotting along another sagebrush and boulder-studded ridge. Concerned that he would drop out of sight, worried that after four days of searching I still hadn't seen the mythical 28-inch buck, and fearing my luck would run out and someone else would shoot this buck, I fired just as the full sun shined into the scope. Did I say I had made a classic mistake? Well, maybe, if you consider the second best scoring mule deer of my life a mistake. I'd shot a prime mule deer with a deep chest, almost black forehead, and a white face of a mature buck. His heavy antlers spread 24 and a half inches and stretched the same distance in main beam length. Tines were thicker than most mule bucks' main beams, and several sticker points gave it wonderful character. It was an impressive looking animal. And for all I knew, it was bigger than that 28-inch buck that the ranchers had been seeing. That's another reality of mule deer hunting. Most bucks look huge at a distance when they're running away and when they're observed by non-hunters who haven't trained themselves to accurately estimate antler size. You must take all this into consideration when analyzing reports of big deer. In my experience, every big buck is worth checking out, but the majority prove to be average at best. You don't want to pass up the best buck you've seen all season for a pig in a poke. Exacerbating this is the mule deer's tendency to migrate out of its summer haunts during the rut and the winter migration. I have chased my share of will-o'-the-wisps that landowners had watched all summer but had migrated to points unknown before the hunting season opened. Always remember that any deer can disappear overnight. So, how do you determine when to hold them and when to fold them? Well, that's a personal decision, but if you have a hankering for big antlers, more than tender stakes, set your goals based on previous benchmarks. If you were fortunate enough to have tagged a 160 class 4x4 in a previous hunt, hold out for something 10 or 20 inches bigger, or perhaps an unusual non-typical. Of course, you can always set your sights on a 180 class buck the first time every time, as long as you don't mind adding another unused tag to your file, hold out for the special monster. It's your party. Another approach is to thoroughly scout your hunting grounds at least two days before the season opens. You'll know the average size of the local bucks and you'll maybe identify one or two top dogs. Then you can decide whether to hold out for them or hold them in reserve while you seek an even bigger specimen. The easiest part of trophy mule deer hunting is choosing your rifle. The old standard is a 270 Winchester throwing 130 grain bullets, but a 25 out 6 with a 120 grain bullet will do just as well, and many veterans use a little 243 Winchester and a 100 grain bullet, although that's a bit weak past 300 yards. Of course, the old 30 out 6 and 280 Remington are more than up to the task. Ditto the short action 308 Winchester and 7mm 08 Remington. I like short actions because of the trim, light, fast handling characteristics. They're an easy rifle to carry, and they can be built like the Kimber 84M that I used in Colorado. Light and handy. If accurate, such a tool is perfect for everything from woodland whitetails and elk to open country antelope and sheep. If you like the insurance of a Magnum, consider the superb 257 Weatherby which will flatten any mule deer out to 400 yards with little or no need for holdover.
Just be sure to check actual trajectory at those distances in the field. Any of the new short action magnums plus the old 7mm and 300 magnums will be more than sufficient. Top them with a good 4 to 12 scope. Fire them from a solid prone or sitting position with a bipod or shooting sticks, and you'll be ready for the longest planes shooting. But you must practice extensively. When you look as long and hard as most of us do for a trophy mule deer, you don't want to blow your chance. Well, that was several hunts wrapped into one there, but boy, that reminds me once again of how challenging mule deer hunting really is you know back when i was a kid in the 60s everyone was shooting big mule deer there was just this blossoming of mule deer across the west for one reason or another big bucks everywhere and in some states you could take more than one so it was pretty common to get really big heavy mature mule deer and people took them for granted they were known as kind of a stupid deer that would bounce out of a draw and then stop turn around and look at you from 200 yards or even 150 so we grew up believing that <laughs> about the time we came of age to actually hunt them, that had all changed. Most of the big dumb ones had, had been taken out and there was a lot more pressure on them and the populations were starting to decline for whatever reason. Um, and you know, they've kind of been declining ever since. Occasionally there'll be several good wet years in a row and the population will really increase, but the big bucks, not so much because you get a lot of does and fawns and then a winter will come along with deep snows and it'll just wipe them out. Gosh, I can remember some in the 90s where the snow was so deep it literally buried them. Um, yeah, it, it gets tough out there on the plains. It's kind of boom and bust for mule deer. But with all the growth in the West, new housing developments and roads and oil development and waterways and dams and highways, and there's just so much pressure now on the habitat declining that even in good places it's just hard to keep that mule deer population up and now we're getting increases in predator numbers that never helps um yeah mule deer are in trouble so if you love mule deer i would recommend joining the mule deer foundation and helping out conservation of mule deer is a big issue these days um, and i surely want to see the numbers come back we have them around our ranch in idaho and we try to do what we can to help the populations. We're doing more planting, uh, adding trees to the landscape, putting in some food crops and whatnot. But boy, we've got to settle that highway problem because so many of them get run over on the highways, especially during the winter migration. And one great project is the uh, building of highway crosses. They will put ramps over the top of the highway. It's like a big bridge but it's for wildlife. Instead of a highway road going over it, it's just graveled and they even plant trees on it and stuff. And uh, deer and elk and everything, all the other animals then freely cross uh, busy highways so you don't get all that roadkill. Great project. You can see some down in uh, Nevada and in Wyoming. They even have underpasses in Wyoming that seem to work. And there's some nice bridges like that up in British Columbia. So they're becoming more and more common. And if you're getting a lot of roadkill in your part of the world where you're seeing deer and, well, any wildlife getting killed a lot on the roads, advocate for those overhead crossings. It's really helping the population a lot. And that's what we need right around here. So I'm hoping we get some fairly soon. At any rate, mule deer hunting, I hope it continues long, long into the future because it's a splendid Western deer and uh, a spectacular animal. They've just got the most interesting antlers, I think, of any of our deer. So I enjoy them and hope you do too. Say you can uh, catch us on Ron's Boomer Outdoors on YouTube where we do more topics of uh, guns and hunting, ammo, ballistics and ammunition and all that. And then Ron Spomer Outdoors TV, a subscription service. You can go to ronspomeroutdoors.com. That's our website. And read my blogs there. And there you can jump up on RSO TV if you want to see some of our hunting videos and some more in-depth reporting on guns and ammo and ballistics and gunsmithing and hand loading. So glad you, uh, you joined us, folks. It's always fun visiting with you. See you next time on Honest and Shoot Straight.